It's big interview time on today's show, and I'm joined right now by Fritz Foltz. He is the chief investment strategist at Three Edge Asset Management. Three Edge, the number three, Edge, AM.com, their website. Fritz Foltz, great to have you back on Money Life. Chuck, great. Thank you very much. Always, always uh, appreciate you having me on your show. Well, I'm glad that we've got you here because I always like your perspective. And this market, I think, calls for some perspective because on the one hand, there's plenty of people who are acting nervous or saying, oh, you know, we've got enough things that the market is scaring me. And at times I have to say I, I heard some political talk this week about like, oh, you know, look what the market's not doing now that we've got a Democrat in office. OK, you can find reasons to be scared. You can find plenty of reasons. And I think people are finding tons of reasons to be optimistic. And yet at some point we're going to put this in the blender, get through a robust and I think it will be a robust kind of recovery. And then we got to figure out what happens next. So is this musical chairs that we're living through right now? Is this, hey, keep dancing while you can, keep moving while you can, but understand at some point this music stops. And if so, when is that music stopping? <laughs> right. So I, I did hear someone quote a few weeks ago, someone said that, you know, sort of similar to your analogy of the musical chairs. He said, the music's still playing, so I'm still dancing, but I'm dancing a heck of a lot closer to the door now than I was before. And as you know, Steve Cucchiaro, our, our chief investment officer, he wrote a commentary recently called Market Euphoria, How Long Can It Last? I would put myself in the more nervous camp. I think there are a lot of reasons to be confident in the market. I guess my question would be how much of that is already priced in based on where we are now. I mean, we've seen just so many signs of speculation and the fact that, you know, this is a market bubble. We have all this liquidity injected into the system. You know, and then we have things like the growth of the ease of investing, like platforms like Robinhood. And you just, there's so much speculation. And as we know, bubbles can go much longer than rational people would think, but ultimately they do all tend to end badly. So, we think if you look at P.E. ratios, valuations are stretched, price-to-sales ratios, they're stretched. But there are people who will say, well, interest rates are so low that the market is not overvalued. But when we do our valuation measures using our model, we find that markets are overvalued now as they ever have been. And our analysis would say that interest rates would have to stay as low as they are today for the next decades for prices to be considered fairly valued. So we are in the markets are significantly overvalued camp. And so we pay close attention to what we would call canaries, if you will. And I could give you a couple of those if you want. Yeah, please. So one of the things we look at is credit spreads. What we measure is the difference between high yield and investment grade credit. And those credit spreads are incredibly narrow now. And if we should see those credit spreads start to widen out again, that for us would be a real warning sign that there could be trouble ahead. If interest rates just continue to rise, you know, we've seen the problem that rising rates have caused the NASDAQ, for example. And, you know, if they continue to rise, they could imperil the equity markets more broadly. And one scenario that we think about a lot is sometimes it doesn't have to be anything cataclysmic that causes the market to correct. For example, in, in 87, you know, you can have something that starts out as a healthy correction. You know, like, oh, well, you know, the market's a bit frothy here and it's just having a, a correction. This is normal. This is good for the market. But sometimes that can really pick up steam and turn into a route. And that is, as I said, that's what we saw in, in 87. So, you know, that's another example of something that we're looking at or thinking about. If you believe that valuations are as extended as you say they are, mm -hmm. have you changed allocations? I mean, it's one thing to say, well, I'm dancing closer to the door, but mm -hmm. are you dancing closer to the door by saying, ah, you know, I, I'm going to get one foot out of the market now. And if my normal allocation was closer to 60, 40, I'm going to be 50, 50, or I'm going to take more of my money overseas. How are you reacting now when you still want to be in because you don't want to miss out on what we've mm -hmm. got, but you do believe that the music's about to end. Right. So two answers to that question. One is we have reduced our overall 
equity position. We did that much earlier. And we have also rotated from U.S. focus to ex-U.S. So we have moved our U.S. equity exposure, and we did this much earlier, but we have moved our U.S. equity exposure down to its minimum across our core strategies, and we have redeployed those assets into markets that we feel are more fairly valued than the U.S. market, and Japanese equities right now are the most attractive of the equity asset classes that we follow. So it's a twofold process. We did reduce earlier the overall amount of equity, and secondly, we also did deploy to focus more on XUS. Now, if you run into, you know, the market starts to correct, we're quite happy to take equity risk off the table if that becomes necessary. But where will you put that money when you take it off the table? Because it's not exactly like the fixed income side of things is going gangbusters or is even necessarily a great you know, alternative in good times, let alone bad times at this point. Uh, you are absolutely right about that. Fixed income has been unattractive in terms of our model for many, many months now. Interestingly, though, one of the things that we are starting to form a narrative around is this idea of what we're seeing is, in, in some respects, you could think of as a, really a, a regime change where you're shifting from monetary policy to a focus on fiscal policy and your asset price inflation to the potential for consumer price inflation and falling interest rates. And now you're moving perhaps into rising interest rate environments. So you, we're seeing this fairly dramatic shift. And one of the results of that shift would be not to focus on fixed income, but to shift your attention more to real assets and commodities. And you know, we could be at the beginning of a fairly strong cycle in the commodities market. So no, we wouldn't be putting those proceeds into the fixed income market, but we would be, and we already have, uh, committed assets to commodities in this environment. You know, because you're going to get potentially a strong global recovery, probably, although the last couple of days not so, but a, a, a weaker dollar. And if you get a real strong bounce back, you know, you're going to have uh, potential for supply demand issues in the commodity space. So we would favor commodities over fixed income at this point. And specifically, which commodities? I mean, not all commodities are created equal, same as not all equities, not all countries, not all whatever. Right, right, right. So we, you know, we're multi-asset investors. And so we typically, more often than not, do rely on investing in ETFs. And those ETFs, when you're buying an ETF, you're, you're buying a basket of commodities. And, and that's fine uh, with us. We typically won't get too much more granular than that. If the commodity space uh, does well, if that's driven by oil or agriculture or energy or any of those factors, we'll benefit by owning the, the broader-based uh, basket of commodities. And, you know, we're not, we don't consider ourselves to be expert in the commodity space. Um, but when we, so when we like real assets, we tend to buy a diversified basket uh, through, the, through the ETF market. So as you're putting this all together, I mean, one of the things that you talked about in there was a robust economic recovery that we're going to mm -hmm. see this significant amount of growth. And of course, everybody wants to be excited by that. But the message from you has got to be don't be excited by this, right? That, that, yeah, okay, this is a wave. It's a wave that we expect. And like any wave, it will pass. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you know, and I guess to some of it, you know, to some extent, it's, it's uh, a very, uh, you know, an example of buy the rumor and, and, and sell the news. You know, you're, you, we've been trying so hard to get money velocity up and the Fed's been trying to get inflation up and the economic recovery since the great financial crisis has been much slower than people wanted. Well, maybe now you're at the threshold of that uh, actually happening, you know, and, and, and that could happen. But I guess my concern is that uh, that could well be priced in to the markets now, and even you know, even beyond that, just because valuations are so stretched, so you could get something that's good for Main Street and good for you know, you have this enormous uh, relief package now, and that's probably going to help people who have really gotten crushed by this pandemic. But it may not be necessarily uh, something that's going to benefit benefit Wall Street as much going forward. 
That's the way I would describe it. You could get benefit to Main Street that won't necessarily be a benefit uh, to Wall Street. I like that a lot. We're almost out of time here. So at what point, from a market standpoint, Mm -hmm. do you believe the market will be not necessarily as it was pre-pandemic, because we're never going to be the same, Mm -hmm. but, but functionally, at what point? Is it 2022, 23, 24? Well, we have said, okay, basically the pandemic's been flushed. Yeah, I think, you know, sometime in the early to mid-2022, we'll get to whatever uh, normal uh, is going, you know, is going to be. I mean, I think obviously the vaccinations are ramping up pretty quickly here. Uh, You know, we'll get a strong economic bounce back in 2021 in the second half. No doubt about that. But if you want to talk about normal, I think normal is we're, we're going to be in well into 2022 before anyone declares things to be normal. That's that's my opinion on that one anyway. Well, Fritz, always great to chat with you. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, it, it was a good, not great in terms of optimism, but it was straightforward, <laughs> and that's what we really needed. Always great to hear from you. Thanks so much. Stay safe. Come back and do this with us again soon. Thank you very much, Chuck. That's Fritz Foltz, everybody. He is the Chief Investment Strategist at 3Edge Asset Management. Three, the number three, edgeam.com on Twitter at 3edgeam. All right, the market call is next. Stephen Gray from Gray Value Management will be here. Time to talk value investing when Money Life rolls on right after this message. 